Well, I like Kirk Douglas, Who and it was a war film, right. and I went down, and it began, and that tracking shot, and I mean, my jaw fell to my lap, and all I can think of, who made this film? And the first thing I did when I went out to the lobby, because I hadn't been paying that much attention to the, credit, uh, to the credits, and then I saw the name Stanley Cooper. Uh, Vivian, are you a fan of Stanley Cooper? <laughs> um, I'm a fan of his understatement. Yes. Uh, uh, what, uh, does, does, why is it fair? I, I think it's always unfair to ask people. I, I hate being asked what my favorite movie is because it really depends on the day. Is there a film of your father's that, uh, that stands out to you that made a significant impression when you saw it, uh, you know, as a young adult or a poor adult? Um. You know, I'm sure everyone's aware of this, that every film he made was so dramatically different. Yeah. That, you know, it, I wouldn't really have any answer that. But I'd say, certainly I always loved Dr. Strangelove. Mm. And, uh, but, you know, I love Cock of Courage, and I love 2001, and Cars of Glory, and Full Metal Jacket, and Lolita. I mean, I think they were, I mean, I think all of his films were absolutely brilliant. I, uh, I had, uh, at the time, it didn't seem like that big a deal. In 2004, uh, four Turner Classic movies, we interviewed sort of four political figures and asked them what their most influential films have been the movies that really stand out to them. And at the time, one of them was Orrin Hatch, another was John Edwards, um, and then he shortly thereafter became the vice presidential candidate. I don't know what he's up to now. He seems to have dropped out of his... <laughs> I'm sure it's fine. Um, uh, and then the other two were Joe Biden, uh, as it turned out. Uh, it wasn't hard to get him to talk. Uh, and the other was John McCain, um, who uh, has been in the news lately. Um, but John McCain, before you move him too much, picked Paths of Glory as the movie. That well, I didn't say that the man was Yeah, obviously, you know, as, we, as you guys descended the, the steps, we heard the music from 2001. That, that the, the movie is iconic. The, the music is is almost more iconic than, than the movie. Billy, uh, you're a composer. You did uh, Full Metal Jacket. jacket. Um, uh, but uh, the composer for 2001, uh, I don't didn't receive any royalties. How did you, how did uh, uh, how did uh, your father come to the decision uh, to arrive at that music? For the film. Um, well, rather difficult question to answer here, but um, or I just thought, the, or just about the fact that he thought that, that he liked using classical composers. He thought they were they were better than anybody you could possibly hire off the street. Well, I think there's no doubt that when you have spectacular artistic achievements married with another spectacular artistic achievement, it's just got to be better. And I think that, you know, for whatever um, reasons people make creative decisions, I certainly know that that was the best decision. I mean, that music is absolutely, I mean... And, and he thought about hiring people. I mean, that was a, if I'm not, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but the, that was a template. And then the realization that, oh, wait a minute, we have, I have something special here. I don't, I don't need to mess with it. You know, um, I think... Alex North originally wrote the, uh, the film school, and I think that like all, you know, creative decisions, you start the film, and he felt that once he'd start to watch the film with, you know, music that he had been using as a time track or anything, you know, he kind of fell in love with it. And that actually happens quite often. People get very married to the temp track and then they get all kind of crestfallen when the composer comes and goes, oh, but I'm good. Right. And then they get, oh. But, um, you know, I just think that what's important is that all artists serve the film, and I'm sure Alex North felt the same way about that, and if he didn't, I understand. Well, let's, uh, I suspect he did. Uh, we'll talk can, can I just interrupt you about another artistic uh, decision that Stanley made, which I think this audience will find amusing, and that was the voice of Hal. Oh, yes. Um, originally, he was going to, uh, he was thinking Marty Balsam. He changed his mind and decided, no, he was too New York. Then he hired um, a, a wonderful English actor by the name of uh, Ma Nigel Davenport, who was actually on the set and did begin for the first week or so doing the voice of Hal off camera for Gary Lockwood and myself. Then he said, no, no, that's, that's wrong. Uh, I'll worry about it in post-production. Right. So he turned to his first assistant, Derek Crackman, and he said, Derek, you do the voice. 
of Hal from now on. This is the voice of Hal for Gary and I. <clears throat> Dive, dive. You better take a stretch, but yeah, it's all like that. It looks like working with Michael Caine. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great. 